Dr. Tafano, and um, thank you so, so much for inviting me. And I'm delighted to be here. And um, I can't see you all either, um, but uh, I, I have already seen some familiar faces and it's uh, lovely to see you and lovely to be here. Um, so my focus this morning is on proportional thinking. And this talk has already been given once and uh, at the Auckland Primary um, Mathematics Association. And um, so uh, hopefully it goes well, and um, it's, pretty, it's pretty similar. So if you were there, you watch out for two different slides that were uh, have been inserted since, but it's, um, I was asked to do the same presentation again, and, and here we go. So proportional thinking, it's a very important part of mathematics and statistics learning, and um, it contributes to lots of mathematics and statistics. We're going to have a look at that. Uh, and my focus this morning is also um, in encouraging our conga engagement and mathematical confidence and capability. Uh, so welcome and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so kia ora e te whanau, ko te herenga waka toku marae, ko te whanau o akopai ki te upuka o te ika a Maui toku whanau, ko Robin Averill a hau, nā mihi nui nui ki a koutou katoa. And that's our beautiful um, Faranui, the meeting house at Te Heringa Waka. It's a stunning building. At the moment, we can't use it because a living power is being built right beside it. But we're looking forward to the whole complex being open again in the future. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, Nā mihi and acknowledgements to the amazing um, Auckland Mathematics Association team and to Robin and team for setting up these online Saturday morning presentations and all the organization is so smooth and I'm really, really grateful. All our student teachers always watch these. I watch them and it's so great to have them um, accessible. So um, huge, huge ups for all of the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, today's focus is on ensuring education is serving learners and society. Um, we're going to look at why proportional thinking is important. Uh, we're going to consider some proportional relationships, estimating proportions. We're going to look at some useful context for teaching this. Some history, as in the curriculum refresh, you'll have noticed that there is an hour of focus included on considering the history of where we've got our mathematical ideas from. And I really warmly welcome that. I think it helps to add the human element, the human perspective to the curriculum that the mathematics skills and strategies that we're teaching. We'll have a bit of te reo Māori and some teaching ideas and there will be some singing. So if you know Zoom, you'll be thinking, how on earth are we gonna do that all together? Well, I've got a plan. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, the main thoughts for today, kia mau ki te kaupapa, uphold the reason and the purpose of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Kia tika te mahi, do it right, and whakamahia, just get on with it and just do it. So um, that can apply to our ideas about proportional thinking, our incorporation of culturally sustaining teaching, our thinking of history, our thinking of uh, the other emphasis that I want to include today is one from the common practice model, which is about critical mathematics and mathematics that is important for society and students being able to see the reasons for why they're learning mathematics from the context that we teach. So all of those thoughts, kia mau ki te kaupapa, kia tika te mahi and whakia mahia, um, all apply to those, those general ideas around the mathematics that we're teaching. Um, so first of all, I want you to think about what kinds of maths involves proportional thinking. And so this is a good time to be using the chat to put your ideas into the chat. What kinds of maths involves proportional thinking? So what are you thinking of when I'm talking about, well, why did you sign up for this? What did you think we were going to be talking about this morning? So what kinds of maths involves proportional thinking? Just a couple of minutes for ideas in the chat to be added. I've just learned how to do presenter view, but I haven't learned how to do presenter view and see chat and see your faces all at the same time. So um, the chat is for you guys and we'll use it several times through the, uh, through the session. Okay, so here were the ideas that I prepared about proportional thinking, some examples. Um, using multiplication or division to alter or understand amounts, using rates, ratios, working out percentage increases or decreases, 
comparing probabilities, understanding proportional relationships. Those are just a few, and I'm sure you've got other things in the chat as well. Um, but I just wanted you to stop and have a thought for one or two of those about some examples of where those might be useful for in your classroom and where those ideas might be useful for people every day. Again, feel free to add your ideas to the chat. Where do people use rates? Why would students need to know about that? When do we use ratios and why would students need to know about that? What are some critical maths ideas that use those things that are significantly important for us to be thinking about? Similarly for percentage increases and decreases. So just take a moment to think about what are some examples of each of those of why we might be doing those? Thank you so much for all of the wonderful chat. I can see the numbers racing up, all your ideas being shared. So the more aware we are of how these ideas are used every day, the more we can help students to relate what we're doing in classroom to their everyday lives and become confident and aware of the mathematics that they're seeing and they're using. Um, so here are some ideas that I prepared earlier. So altering recipes for more or fewer people, converting between units, Using rates, all kinds of ideas, slope of a graph. Pam Purgis got a nice chapter in the Teaching Primary Maths book on children's uh, in a minute. What can we do in a minute? What can we do in the next three seconds? Um, and so on from, from the idea of, from literature books, children's books. Um, other rates, our oven heats up at a rate or the um, air fryer eats, heats up at a particular rate. Are they the same, the oven and the air fryer, in terms of how quickly they heat up and how quickly they cool? Um, using ratios, some examples there. Comparing probabilities, just some examples for us to be thinking about. Um, the other thing that I thought that would be useful for us to focus on is to think about um, we need to teach students about proportional thinking. We need to develop their understanding about these ideas and we need to help them remember these ideas. So some of the activities that we do are really based on helping them understand and develop a concept. And some of them are about helping them remember. So um, some of the activities that we'll look at, I want you to think about, is that really gonna help them with understanding or remembering or a bit of both? Because uh, we need to work on both. So are these ideas, um, easy for children to work out and easy for our students? Or is this a difficult part of the curriculum So uh, for students? So um, in my experience, I think that some students can struggle with proportional thinking. And there are some reasons we've set them up to struggle a little bit in terms of what we've done before this. So um, if we think about Proportional thinking is not actually intuitive for our students for Akonga. And if you think about the emphasis on counting that they've had in the early years and amounts, we've really emphasized counting and amounts. And so they're tending to think first of how many and how much rather than proportions. So if we realize we have to help them shift from that thinking, yes, counting is important and amounts are important, but thinking proportionally is different from those. It builds on those. So for example, really young children want a big pile of coins, regardless of the value, because they feel they've got a lot, um, rather than fewer coins or notes that might have a higher value. So there are some things that are built into the way that they're thinking that can make proportional thinking difficult for them. So the upshot of that is we need to give lots of proportional experiences and emphasis to help our conga develop and recognize that they're using proportional thinking. And the good thing is we can do this across most parts of the mathematics and statistics curriculum. And so I thought it would be useful to look at some of our achievement objectives and to think, is proportional thinking really important across the curriculum or is it just a small part of what we do? And so the next slide I'm going to give you um, about half of uh, as many as I could fit on the slide, about half of the achievement objectives from uh, level six. And I want you to be looking through those achievement objectives and thinking which of these require some understanding of proportion or some use of proportion. 
So what kinds of words are you going to be looking for? You're going to be looking for those words that were on that previous slide about rates, ratio, proportion, relationships, um, probabilities. You're going to be looking for those kinds of words. So I've numbered them, not because they're numbered in the curriculum, but so that you can put into the chat if you which numbers you think, oh, yes, that's got some proportional thinking that's related to that particular achievement objective. Um, so here they are. <clears throat> Don't forget that lovely phrase at the beginning and a range of meaningful contexts, which that really speaks to our critical mathematics, meaningful contexts. Students will think mathematically and statistically. They will solve problems and model situations that require them to. And there I've numbered some, just about half of the um, achievement objectives from level six. So if you could read through and stick into the chat any that you think, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, that you think, yes, that's got, they have to have some proportional thinking to be able to work on that achievement objective or work on that mathematics. So I'm looking for the chat numbers to go up. I'll stop talking so you can think. Thank you so much. And when I <clears throat> when I had a look at these, um, this is what I thought in terms of the shading for the ones that include some aspect of proportional thinking or where proportional thinking would be useful and important to help students understand these things. So if students are arriving at high school without proportional thinking, this is level six, so this is a bit further on, but um, even at level five, there is a lot that requires proportional thinking and level four, it's really kicking in there as well. So students who aren't able to think proportional, proportionally are really going to be severely disadvantaged in our lessons and, and um, from, from these levels up. So um, it shows, I'm trying to show the importance of us really helping students get a really strong sense of thinking proportionally, being able to use fractions, percentages, decimals really confidently and well, being able to think about rates and ratio and, uh, and being able to talk about those things. Um, so I want to just take a step out and look a little bit back at history. So um, where did these ideas of proportional thinking come from? And in fact, um, Every community in civilization, every community uses ideas of proportions, um, but they might not have formally discussed and formally written ways of thinking about proportions, uh, but informally they're ideas that we use all of the time. Um, so if we look back to where did we get these symbols from, there are two symbols that have been used for proportion, and you'll recognize that alpha, where the circumference is proportional to diameter, that's the symbol that's most often used now. But it came from somewhere, and actually it's um, fairly recent. The first writing about proportion, the first published writing about proportion, um, was in 300 BC, or the first recorded, um, in a book from Euclid's Elements. And so we can find this history, and it's never been so easy to find out history of different ideas. So since then, there has been a written form of talking about and thinking about this mathematical idea of proportion. Um, it takes a lot of ink to write, is proportional to, and so a symbol is really nice to be able to say, just to represent that. And so the symbol with the four dots, I had never seen that until I started ex exploring this. Um, but a couple of Williams have helped us with these, uh, these symbols. So William Altred in 1500s uh, used the four dots. And then William Emerson first used the alpha um, about uh, 1768 in that publication. And so for about 250 years, we've been using the symbol alpha. And so when you're working with that with students, they are now joining this group for the last 250 years that have been using this nice symbol alpha to show is proportional to. 
Um, so the circumference is proportional to diameter, and that's in our understanding. If we have a wider circle, a larger diameter, it must have a bigger distance around the outside of the circle. So a bigger diameter, a bigger circumference, or a smaller diameter, a smaller circumference. So um, we can start with simple ideas that make sense to, um, to students' ideas. Uh, some other examples that I thought that show conversions um, that I find interesting and that link to measurement as well as to number um, is this, and I know, I'm sorry about the quality of the photograph, but I can describe what this is. It's a chest of drawers. It's, I saw it in a museum, it's in the Science Museum in London, and if you, depending on the quality of your screen and how big it is, you might be able to read what's on the each drawer. There's a drawer that says Paris, one that says Rio Janeiro, um, there's Rome, there's Philadelphia, there is Madrid, Malaga, so each drawer has got a place name on it. And you might also be, be able to see that there are weights on some of the drawers that are, have been pulled out to demonstrate. And uh, so what this is, is a, um, it's a conversion. Before we had Google and could put in this many pounds, how many kilograms is it? Um, things had to be done by actually comparing the actual weights. And the actual weights used in many different places were completely different from one another. So one of the jobs of the consoles to go when they went to the different countries and cities and towns was to gather what are the weights in those places so that for commerce, our, um, our people will know uh, how much to charge and how, how, how to convert from our units, from imperial units in terms of Britain, to the units of the places where they were doing commerce. You can see it was a really complicated, complicated system. And um, right, conversions would have been incredibly important. Um, and you, it, also this history just shows why the international system of kilogram, centimeter, meter must have been such an exciting time for everybody at that time because it removed the need for every country to have this kind of collection of conversions. Um, so just a little bit more information about it. This cabinet was held at the Royal Mint in London from 1818. So it's not that long ago. It housed weights collected by British consuls stationed overseas, each containing standard weights from the place marked on the front. Each was then carefully compared with the British standard. But the situation was even more complicated because for example, in Rome, if you were buying gold and silver, you needed to use one set of weights. But if you were buying medicines, you needed a different set or commercial goods, a third set. Dry goods had another set. Um, after the weights had been compared, merchants could finally accurately um, have conversion rates for each product. So um, rates were particularly important in that time. But um, and when we're teaching measurement, the idea of these standard international units, you can see just how powerful that they were and how necessary they were. Sorry, that's my little explore into some, some history around the topic. And, and I don't know, I find it fascinating. I, I think students probably would and see more of a reason of how the math that they're learning today fits in the wider scheme of mathematics over time. Um, and I think children are easy, can discuss proportions. Um, and so in easy ways. So for example, I can think about how hungry I am and, um, and that's proportional to how long since my last meal. If I, more time passed, I'm more hungry. And I've got the nice symbol in there to help how good I am at my sport depends on how much practice I do. More practice, better at sport. How easily I remember new ideas proportional to how much practice I do. More practice, better remembering. So these are three contexts that I just pulled out of thin air, but I'd like you in the chat to put in some more of your own examples of something that gets bigger as something else gets bigger. So the more, the more. I'm more hungry when it's longer since my meal. I'm better at sport when I do more practice at sport. I remember new ideas when I do more practice. Can you put a few of your own creative examples in to the chat? The more, the more. The more I sleep, the more refreshed I feel the following day. 
I can see some ideas are coming in. That's great. Uh, one of the people at a previous presentation had an example that related to the more baked beans that she ate. And I won't tell you what the other aspect of that, but you can imagine, I'm sure. They're proportional relationships. As one thing increases, so does another thing. And the examples in the context keep the ideas in the, um, in the scope for the children that we're working with. And I believe that they can also think about inverse relationships, the more the less. So I eat more food, I'm less hungry. The more I eat, the less hungry I am. More maths practice, less confusion. More sports practice, less energy. Longer keynote, less pleasure. So I'm sure that students can do the more, the more, and they can also think from their personal experience about the more, the less. And the student-generated examples are usually far more engaging than the ones that I can make up. So um, just some easy ways to, you might have five minutes at the start of a lesson or at the end of a lesson that's about something completely different, but you can jump back to, let's reinforce some ideas about proportional relationships. Let's have a few examples from the class about these ideas. I promised you some te reo Māori. So the next slide has got some examples of words te reo Māori but they're all a bit jumbled up. So I'm going to ask you to, to read the terms and think if you can work out which line up with which. So ngā kupu Māori, uh, the word for proportions, ngā ōwehenga. And so now's the time, I know you're muted, but you could pronounce ngā ōwehenga and um, get warmed up for our singing, which is coming soon. Uh, ngā ōwehenga is for proportions. Remember, there'll be a test at the end. And so, oh, here are some, I skipped two slides. I've told you the answers. Oh, never mind. Okay, so here they are. Can you work out uh, tata katoa, nuenga, e tahi, tata kore? And which, is the, which are the words for which? Which match up with which? I stole my own thunder by jumping two slides. Can't believe I did that. So um, some of you might recognize particular words here. You might know them all completely and use them already. And so that's great. For those of us who haven't, um, katoa, we think about tato katoa, everybody together. So that's probably to do with an all. And kore, um, none. So the tata is probably almost. Uh, uh, people in other presentations have seen the word nui in nuinga and thought, oh, well, that's probably to do with big. So that might be most. And uh, for some, the word etahi. So we'll just say those again and you can say them as well. Na owehenga for proportions. Tata katoa, almost all. Nuinga, most. Etahi, some. Tata kore, almost none. Uh, so how do we incorporate these? And this is, my student teachers ask me, okay, I found some words in te reo Māori and I have included them in my lesson plan, but what do I do with them? And so, um, so we've had discussions with student teachers about having students pronounce them, having students understand the meaning of them, and for some aspects of maths, as you know, actually the Māori words convey quite a lot of mathematical ideas within the words themselves. So they help build their understanding of mathematics as well as te reo Māori. Use the words yourselves as teachers or student teachers, as I tell them. Use them and expect your ākonga to use them. So help them with pronunciation and expect them to be used. Um, practice the pronunciation. Have the words on wall displays so that they've got reminders around the classroom walls. Help them remember and build them into your learning intentions for the lesson so that when you recap on the lesson, you're coming back to what those words are. And they'll slowly build. If you have three or four new te maths terms each lesson, they'll slowly build. And uh, they might not remember them all, but they'll become more familiar with the sounds and they'll be able to decode. And for the students who have got good te reo Māori, they're then the experts and they can help everybody else. So, as we've discussed, that's how the linking goes for the different meanings. Now, I hope you've been warming up your vocal cords. 
uh, for the singing. And so, and I hope your uh, pictures are on so we can see your faces. Now's the time to turn your cameras on, um, but not your microphones, because with Zoom, it'll only pick up one voice at a time. And um, I'd hate you to feel exposed that it was your voice that was being picked up. But if we have all of your cameras on and you can all see one another, you're going to sing vigorously with our song and I'll teach it to you, but you'll sing along. And uh, then you'll have something that you can use with your classes as well. And it's about learning these terms. Uh, singing is a historical pedagogy from with so many cultures, almost all cultures use song to help people remember things. And so why we should be using songs to help people remember things as well. And so uh, this is how it goes. I haven't got perfect pitch, so I'm probably not singing on the pitch that you can see. Apologies if you've got perfect pitch. Um, and I'm not singing on the notes, but it goes like this. Almost all Tata Katoa, a word for most knowing a word for some is etahi, almost none, Tata Kore. Right. Now that was sort of slow, but so that you could learn it. But we're going to do it again, and we want to see all your vigorous faces looking happy and singing away. And if you really don't want to sing, at least look happy and mouth the words. We'll be convinced that you're singing. Are you ready? Here we go. Almost all tata katoa, a word for most knowing a, a word for some is etahi, almost none, tata kore. Oh, lovely, but you didn't quite look happy enough. I want to see some real energy this time. We're going to go even faster. Are you ready? Hopefully everybody in your house is rushing around and coming to hear your wonderful singing and maybe joining in. Here we go. Are you ready? Almost all tata katoa, a word for most knowing a, a word for some is etahi, almost none tata kore. Yay! Give yourself a great round of applause. Excellent. Thank you so much for humoring me. But really, uh, seriously, songs and singing are just very, very helpful for helping us remember things. And that's why they're used in commercials. That's why they're used on television, on the radio. You remember things. And so it's a powerful tool for us to help children remember. And you will have children in your classes, even if you don't feel singing is the thing that is your forte, you'll have students in your class that singing is their forte. And um, if they make up the song for one another and they lead it, um, that saves you uh, feeling, I can't sing, therefore we're not going to do this. Anyway, uh, so another way we can help students with proportions is to have them estimating. And so the next slide has got a range of different um, things that I want you to estimate some proportions. And again, the chat is a good place for you to put in and I should have numbered these so that you could have done it easily like the next one. But anyway, here they come. I want you to choose two or three of these and think, what proportion do you think? It's an estimate. It's, to, it's just getting a sense of. And if you don't want to tie yourself down to one particular specific number, then give a range. So what proportion of cats are ginger? Well, I think that it might be between 20 and 30%, for example, a range. So um, add into the chat some of your ideas for what are your estimates of these proportions? Choose either start at the top, start at the bottom, start at the middle, but I'll give you a few minutes to think about each one. <clears throat> If we were in a room, I'd have you talking with the person beside because, uh, and in a classroom, I certainly would have students discussing these things because it's in discussing that they develop their ideas of proportion, their ideas of thinking by negotiating with one another. They get a sense of different sizes. I want you to have a think, please, about the second to last one. What proportion of teachers can list and describe the nine Pacific values in Tapasa? And I've given you a, the tapasar compass on the top right. But maybe it's too blurry to see what they are. Oh, what a shame. But what proportion do you think?
In terms of critical mathematical thinking, we can be also thinking about are there any of these that we might want to increase the proportion of and how would we go about doing that? Are there any we might want to decrease the proportion of and how would we go about doing that? So we, the critical maths doesn't have to be a whole new thing that you put into your lesson. It could be the way that you use the activities that you have included. So you could put some uh, questions for estimating proportions of things that are important to the students in your school, either environmentally or socially or um, fiscally, and, and, and ask these questions about what are the proportions and how could we increase or how could we decrease? Um, it's just using maths for a really good purpose. Okay, so you've thought about the uh, Tapasar question, and now I'm going to give you the answer. Um, there are nine, is respect, leadership, service, reciprocal relationships, family, belonging, love, spirituality, and inclusion. And those nine values are in Tapasar and the Pacific Education Plan because across Pacific communities, um, they're believed to be really important for um, how we interact and how we work. Um, some research that I've done with colleagues for Pepe and Ali has shown that Pacific, uh, Pacific people and Pacific educators think of these values in different ways to non-Pacific, and often they're felt very deeply and um, and uh, and and very strongly. And so um, we put together ways in which Pacific educators believe and think about these values to give all teachers a way of thinking about if I've got Pacific students in my classrooms and the Pacific families around those students, how can I re reflect the Pacific values in the way in which I'm teaching and, and the way in which our school runs. Um, so they're important. That's why I wanted to have that one included on the list of your estimating proportions. Some further examples for proportions for a purpose and Akonga taking action. Um, Lisa Dara and team wrote a chapter in a, a, the uh, orange book on middle years teaching mathematics and statistics, and they were looking at how to use proportions to explore commercial fishing. Um, and again, how can we increase the proportion of around New, ocean around New Zealand that's protected? These are some ideas of using proportion. Um, some other critical maths kinds of contexts. What proportion of people are reducing their plastic waste? and plastic use and how can we in increase that and what proportion of people can are reducing their carbon footprint and how can we increase this proportion we've got really um, significant issues and challenges and mathematics is such a powerful tool for all of these helping students see the power of mathematics can only help them see um, feel empowered and see the usefulness of our subject area what proportion of classes don't sing together regularly and how can we decrease this proportion? Um, right. Using equipment is another great way of helping students with um, proportional ideas. So put, please put a couple of ideas in the chat about how can we use equipment to help students think about proportions? What equipment might be useful to us? Add some ideas in the chat, please. And, uh, and then we'll look at the next slide. Remember, we've got rates, we've got conversions, we've got ratios, we've got fractions, percentages. So by thinking about those kinds of topics and proportions, think about the kind of equipment that is going to help with understanding and remembering these ideas. Thank you for your ideas in the chat. Here's a few that I prepared earlier. Measuring jugs, cups, teaspoons, tablespoons, kitchen scales, doing some cooking, buckets, measuring jugs, sports equipment, containers, food coloring for predicting and mixing ratios, the different colors, what's going to predict, what's going to happen if I add two, two cups of yellow and three cups of green, what color am I going to have? What if I have two and five green, what color am I going to have? Predicting and exploring different ratios. Um, it's by the exploring that they're going to be be helping learn. Uh, the next few slides are going to give just again some other ways, some ideas of teaching strategies um, that can be used for rates and ratios and places where you can find these. Um, so the next slide 
Uh, this comes from a chapter in a new book come out this year called Kite Hoi, Education for Aotearoa. And it's from Tony Trinick and Piata Allen's work. Uh, and the students have drawn a map and you can see there's a scale for the map. 17 centimetres represents 170 kilometres, two centimetres, 20 kilometres. And the map is of the area um, that these students are, are living, living in and travelling across. So this chapter is about Uru Uru Whenua, Wayfinding on Land, and it's a 2D map, and uh, Aokonga have made a map of their own local area. In this chapter, Tony and Piata talk about um, ways of using uh, Māori ideas and Mataranga Māori, and which is very timely because we've got in the refreshed curriculum the mana orite mo Mataranga Māori, equal emphasis, equal standing for Mataranga Māori. And so they've got this framework that helps us think about how to do that. And they talk about examining the indi indigenous knowledge and, uh, and then discussing the ideas using appropriate indigenous language for us, Te Reo Māori, and examining the design elements and the mathematical principles together to show how mathematics can add value to understanding without detracting from the indigenous knowledge. So it's a step forward from when we, for example, take tukutuku panels and we look at them for the mathematics, and that's the aspect that we've got. We look at kofaifai panels and we talk about them in terms of transformation geometry. So in this cultural symmetry framework, the idea is to give equal emphasis to talking about the kofaifai and the understanding of kofaifai, where they are, how they're made, what they represent, the indigenous knowledge around that as well as the mathematical knowledge and how those two aspects of our understanding can contribute and help one another in terms of student remembering and they're learning not only the mathematics but they're learning some context within which that mathematics can be described. I like this model because it does, it gives attention to both aspects and I know Panya Tamaro has given one of these speeches, uh, one of these talks as well and she's talked about the same idea equal emphasis and equal importance to both aspects. The maths is not the Māori knowledge, the Māori knowledge is not the maths, but we can use the two together to help develop understanding and, and motivate students. Um, another example I want to use is from uh, Sinapi's work. Sinapi, who you can see here, and Sinapi's brother. Um, Sinapi looked at Sasa, and you can go on YouTube and find all lots of different Sasa examples. She looked at Sasa as a way of engaging her learners with mathematics. So they looked at algebra in terms of Sasa. They looked at uh, number in terms of Sasa. The, um, they looked at angles. You can see the angles that they're making. Um, and we can use it for proportions as well. If we watch a whole Sasa dance and we could think, what proportion of the claps are single claps? What proportion of the claps are double claps? What proportion of the dance has the women in the front and has the men in the back? We can just use the context of Sasa, which some students, the reason behind this study was that Sanapi found she taught the same students in her Pacific group as she did in mathematics. In Pacific group, they were all wonderfully excited, enthusiastic and passionate. And in mathematics, they seemed like a different group of students. She wanted to meld together the things that they had a passion for and what she wanted to teach them. And this was her way. There's an article in set um, of Sinapi's work. Um, there are lots of other places that you can go to for ideas, for activities, for proportional thinking. Enrich is a great source, as you know, of rich tasks. And I like the idea of the black currentiest drink. How can we make a drink half as black currenty, twice as black currenty? So there's lots of ideas there. I'm not going to go to those links, but it's just a reminder. Um, the examples that to come back to, what is proportional thinking all about? Because uh, I'm on my last few minutes of the talk. Um, rates, ratios, percentage increase, decrease, probabilities proportional relationships. Um, we've talked about these teaching ideas as ways of helping with proportion, but really those teaching ideas you can use for 
any aspect of our mathematics that you're working with. We just had the context of um, we had the context of proportions. Um, I wanted to point out sometimes our students don't see what we're doing to try and all integrate aspects of te ao Māori into our teaching. So wanted to point out the, try, the things that I tried to do as ways of giving mana o rite. Uh, we had some use of te reo Māori and the whakatauki, the idioms. Uh, I think that the activities that we've done link well with the cultural competencies, ako, wānanga, whanaungatanga, manakitanga, tangata whenuatanga. We talked about pedagogies that fit with te ao Māori, particular um, working together and singing and repetition. And um, Tony and Piata's chapter was another example. So now it is time for the test. So I hope you're ready for the test. I want you to think to yourself about two ideas from today's talk. Ah, te heaha te kupa Māori mo proportion. I told you you needed to remember that because there'd be a test. So if you've remembered that, all of you that remember it, stick it in the chat. Uh, think about the proportion of today's idea you'll share with colleagues. Uh, and what will you use in your teaching? And what proportion of this proportion will your akanga enjoy? And I hope that you now have a little earworm of the waiata so that you can be singing it and singing it with your students and the proportion of the nine values. Hopefully you can list a few more now if you didn't already list the nine and you can be thinking about how to make them more visible in your school. And so that has been a rush through, but thank you very, very much. And I hope it has been useful for you at least one or two slides. And uh, thank you once again, uh, very much to uh, Auckland Mathematics Association 